Thank you everyone for joining us. I will turn the program over to Samar Ali to begin. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Over the past 15 hours, the world has watched in horror as Russia has done what we all feared and hoped would not happen. It has attacked Ukraine by land, sea, and air. The attacks are coming in from Ukraine's eastern border that it shares with Russia, and from Ukraine's northern border shared with Belarus, and the Russian military has also come in from the southern part of Ukraine through Crimea. Over 25 cities in Ukraine are under attack. The main airport has been bombed, and bridges across the country are being demolished as we speak, along with other infrastructure. The capital city of Kiev is effectively being held hostage. To make sense of this evolving crisis, Vanderbilt University and our project on unity and American democracy have convened this esteemed panel of experts to help us understand the impact of Russia's military invasion into the Ukraine and what our next steps should be. Before we go further, we would like to take a moment of silence for the 40 Ukrainian soldiers who have been killed overnight and for the pain and terror that over 40 million innocent Ukrainians are currently suffering through. Thank you. Joining us today, we have Professor Catherine David, a Vanderbilt Assistant Professor of Russian and Eastern European Studies. Professor David's expertise is on the history of the, Soviet of the Soviet Ukraine and Russia. Her current book project, One Ukraine Under God, examines how the officially atheist Soviet state used religious institutions to govern and transform its newly Soviet populations in Western Ukraine during and after the Second World War. She most recently, this past December, wrote a piece in the Washington Post on the latest escalations between Russia and Ukraine titled Made by History. Thank you, Professor David, for joining us. Along with Professor David, we have Vanderbilt Professor Frank Weislow, a professor of history and Russian studies emeritus who has experience on modern Russia and on the politics, society, economy, and culture of the pre-revolutionary Russian empire. Along um, with our two other esteemed panelists, we have Lieutenant General Jack Gardner joining us, former Deputy Commander of the US European Command and also the Unity uh, Project board member who has expertise in military operations abroad. And finally, Professor Peter Pomerantsev, who is a British Ukrainian journalist and senior fellow at the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University, where he also co-directs the ARENA Initiative and has expertise on Russian propaganda. He has written two books on the subject, both titled, One, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, The Surreal Heart of the New Russia, and most recently out, This is Not Propaganda, Adventures in the War Against Reality. To begin, I would like to ask each of you to spend two to three minutes giving us your perspective on Russia's military invasion of Ukraine overnight. Professor David, Professor Weislow, and Professor Pomerantsev, please also provide us insights into your analysis on which version of Vladimir Putin we are dealing with here. Would also like before we begin to ask during this discussion for everyone tuning in with us here today at Vanderbilt to please put comments and questions in the box. Professor David, we will begin with you. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and thank you for putting together this, this panel. Um, I wanna start by just saying how heartbroken I am about what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, I visited Ukraine for the first time 10 years ago, and I've been back almost every year since up until the pandemic. Um, and if it weren't, for the generosity of the people that I've met there. Um, I really wouldn't be here today um, as someone who, who has the privilege of teaching and researching about this region. So I'm, I'm really thinking about my friends there and um, I'm hoping that things will improve soon. In, in thinking about background for this, this conflict, um, you know, as a historian, I think there's a lot of places we can start a thousand years ago with the founding of medieval Kiev or more recently with the collapse of the USSR or with Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014. But I think it's important to talk about actually what just happened on Monday of this week. 
Um, on Monday, Vladimir Putin gave this meandering speech, mm -hmm. um, which concluded with him recognizing the independence of these separatist republics in eastern Ukraine, and then uh, later announcing that there was going to be military support to, uh, to these republics to defend their independence, which was largely seen by everyone as, as a pretext for a larger invasion. He could make the argument that Ukraine was illegally occupying uh, these, these territories. But I think what, what he said on Monday uh, really does show us a lot about how he sees this particular conflict. There's a lot of debates, and I'm sure we'll address them today, about whether we should understand Putin as a rational leader who is reacting understandably to the specter of NATO expansion, or someone who is not so rational and motivated by these kinds of long-held grievances and an urge to get the world to take Russia seriously, no matter the costs. I see sort of flaws in both of those um, depictions, but mm -hmm. I think the speech that Putin gave on Monday and his recent actions make it hard to come to the conclusion that this is all about NATO. I mean, in this hour long mm -hmm. speech he gave on, on Monday, he spent much more time on the history of Ukraine, a history that was deeply inaccurate, um, arguing that Ukraine doesn't have the right to exist and comparatively little time on, on his grievances mm -hmm. against NATO. And I think more telling is that he put forward Russia's frustrations with NATO as part of a, a much larger story, an entire history where Russia has always tried to do the right thing, but it's been victimized by the West and, and NATO is part of that story. But another part of that story is, is the lack of recognition that Russia has, has a right to determine Ukraine's political future, which is what his, his argument was. Um, I think that one of the things that is, is interesting about Putin's focus on the past is that I think it's really out of step with how Russian people and Ukrainian people view this conflict right now. Uh, Russians and Ukrainians both want stability. They don't want war. There are Russians who are risking a lot protesting in the streets right now about this conflict. And in the speeches that Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has given, he really has spoken to that. He's spoken to the fact that, you know, there are connections between Russia and Ukraine, but these are connections that should allow for our countries to be able to work together. And they should also allow for the Russian people to understand that the version of Ukraine that is pre being presented on their news is not the Ukraine of, of, of reality. Um, and I think this fact that, you know, people in Russia and Ukraine are focused on, on reality and on the future, um, is an, you know, a chance for potentially this, this conflict to, um, you know, not get as out of hand uh, if, if the Russian people and, and Ukrainian people don't want it. But I, I, I do fear that sort of the, the version of Ukraine that is presented on, on Russian state media, um, it does resonate with some people in Russia. And so th I think it's really a matter of kind of coming back to reality and, and not being stuck in these debates of the past and, and instead focusing on these countries' futures where they have a lot in common. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for that, Professor David. Um, Professor Weislow, could you go next, please? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I find myself a bit uh, adrift with contemporary events. It, most historians will immediately run and hide behind the fact that they are um, uh, chroniclers of the past and not predictors of the future, but we find ourselves as I know Professor David would agree oftentimes um, uh, in our teaching and in our writing adrift in contemporary events and trying to understand them through um, the lens of the past. So I, I find myself at several um, different junctures um, uh, today. Astonished um, uh, is, is one uh, since just as most of the reporting out of Ukraine in the last 48 hours suggests, the population itself didn't believe that this particular outcome, um, as much as it was being predicted by American government um, uh, intelligence resources, this particular outcome was in fact um, the, the one that would come about. Um, beyond astonishment, I also find myself, as was true of Professor David, reading Putin on, on history. Um, it, as an imperial historian, I, I, I find 
I find his reading of, of, of history to be incredibly reminiscent of what one would find in the 19th century. So that your question about which Putin are right. we dealing with um, is, is one where as much as I've been resistant to the notion over the years that Putin is a new czar or a new Stalin, mm -hmm. um, his repudiation of the, of the Soviet period and his embrace of uh, Russian czarist imperialism is, um, is, is really quite pronounced. Mm. I mean, you, can, you can break these views down in, in a whole variety of ways, but mm -hmm. the, the notion that, um, that the state its power, um, both its objective presence and its symbolic presence, that the state is the motive force of history, that a powerful state is a guarantee mm -hmm. of Russian security and mm -hmm. that a weakened state is in fact a guarantee of anarchy, disorder and subjugation. Um, uh, this is a trope that that Stalin used as 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 well, uh, remarkably, and 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 finally, a, a mm -hmm. notion that um, uh, anarchy and disorder and disintegration constantly threaten Russia um, uh, if the state is 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 weakened. Mm -hmm. um, that you could find your, that one would find themselves at the beginning of the 21st century, considering mm -hmm. ideas that ultimately failed remarkably in, in the Russian empire in the early 20th century adds to the astonishment of, of, of the moment. I mean, mm -hmm. a, a, a historical anecdote and, and, and only yeah. when I find myself thinking, which czar exactly? Um, mm -hmm. it, is, is this, and a good place perhaps to go would be the previous last czar, Nicholas II. Nicholas II in the fall of 1914 um, stood victoriously in the city of Lviv, called by the Russians Lvov, called by the Poles Lvov. Um, uh, although Russian Imperial Army forces had been defeated in East Prussia, they were victorious in, in the Southeast and there Nicholas took the homage of Russian officialdom, Russian Orthodox clergy, um, a population of officers and Im imported soldiers, this in the fall of 1914. In the fall of 1917, he was under house arrest um, because mm. um, the, the forbearance of a population to this sort of war, World War I and the Ukraine crisis are two very different things, of course. The forbearance of the Ru Russian population only has a certain number of limits. War has unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And so you mm -hmm. really do find yourself asking, as some are at the moment, as Zelensky, in fact, in his Russian speech, um, mm -hmm. uh, not broadcast on Russian television, ask the Russian population, what is it that you, citizens of Russia, um, intend to do about this situation? Not today, not tomorrow, mm -hmm. but as commentators noted, um, the last depressing invasion was the invasion of Prague in 1968. Um, and it took decades and hopefully it won't take decades, but um, that popular forbearance in the Russian Federation is also a question to consider um, in the long term going forward. And with that, I'll also yield. Thank you. Lots to think about. General Gardner, we turn to you. Uh, thanks, Herman. Thanks for letting me join you. You know, like all of you, I'm amazed at the events of the last 24 hours. And in a lot of ways, to me, I think it's, it's almost a reality check or a wake-up call. Uh, to me, there are three things that the United States should be doing. One is, you know, what immediate actions do we need to take in response to the Russian invasion? And to me, those are, uh, there's a lot of discussion about sanctions. And I think it's probably broader than sanctions. It's, it's almost economic isolation. Sanctions, uh, export ban. Uh, delinking for the international financial system, things that put enough pain on them that they can't sustain what they're doing for a long period of time. I also think we need continue assistance to the Ukrainian military. Uh, this is the United tank system, air defense systems, intelligence, maybe cyber assistance. Uh, the mm -hmm. Russians went in apparently with 130,000 soldiers. They can't occupy the entire country. 
how do we help the Ukrainians continue to fight so they make it you know, so painful for the Russians that they can't sustain that either. Mm-hmm. I think we need to, uh, and we're kind of getting this, but establish a clear NATO position. And I think we're achieving that, but reinforce the Baltics, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, deploy a NATO response force, which would be a visible sign of kind of NATO unity. And I think a key one that we had to act on quickly is how do we help the Europeans and especially Germany break their dependence on Russia for cool mm-hmm. oil and natural gas? I think we have the mm-hmm. capacity to do that with some of the nations and put it in place before the next winter season hits. Um, mm-hmm. The second major topic for me is how do we get ahead of the uh, kind of the growing Chinese Russian partnership? Right. Both nations obviously have different values and see the world different than we do and different than our allies do. And I think we need to kind of thoughtfully think our threat through how do we operate in that environment so we're not reactive, we're proactive. And that'll take some thinking to do. And the last one for me is how do you establish all this in a bipartisan manner? Well, that's been elusive for us the last 10 years. From the end of World War II up until the 90s, our foreign policy was generally pretty bipartisan. And although we did some dumb things, made some mistakes, at the macro level, it was pretty successful. I think the question is, how do we achieve that now? And I think on the, the long-term you know, Chinese-Russian partnership, if we logically think our way through that and develop a kind of a bipartisan approach. And then to me, a key thing would be to see in the next three or four days, uh, the president and you know, the leaders of both parties in the House and Senate standing in front of the White House saying, you know, we have internal disagreements in a bunch of areas. But in this one area, especially Russia, Ukraine, uh, we're of one mind and uh, have that be kind of the national picture that people see. Uh, Thanks for letting me join you today. I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you. We're going to be coming back to that last point as well. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Professor Pomerantsev. Thank you very much, Professor Ali. Um, um, it's so such insightful introductory remarks. I've learned so much already, and what a, a wonderfully sort of different bouquet of, of speakers. Um, look, I think a lot of us are expressing shock and helplessness. There is actually a lot all of us can do, and I see 296 participants here who are probably all very young and tech savvy, and there's a lot of online stuff that we can be doing right now, um, which are incredibly important to keep up the morale of people in Ukraine. I'm speaking to friends, family, colleague across Ukraine right now, journalists, government officials, um, academics, students. And, and one of the things they're like, where, where are the sanctions? It's so important for them to feel the sanctions are happening because it feels that somebody cares and is doing something. They know they have to fight on their own, but it's incredibly important. And, and at the moment, um, the whole there's a lot of energy around uh, banning Russia from SWIFT, which is a huge hit on Russia. It's being blocked currently in the G7 by three countries, well, G7, by three countries generally, Germany, Italy, I think Hungary or Cyprus, I can't remember. But anyway, Germany and Italy are clearly the big ones. Um, please, if you can, uh, do all your online activity. It, it will change and help save Ukraine and, and save all of us from, well, from what, 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 what are we being saved from? What, what is this, this, this thing that we're facing? Um, some people get it straight away. Uh, at the United Nations, it was very noticeable that the representatives from African nations saw Putin's speeches, and they might not be experts on Russia. They, they knew what they were looking at. Um, imper- we call it different names, imperialism. I don't want to get into a political science debate about fascism, but let's just look what it is. Um, let's look at his speeches and his language and the behavior that we saw in this a macabre circus around his invasion. Um, we saw over and over again how he was humiliating the people in his security cabinets. If you saw the event, he called every member of his cabinet up one by one and forced them to say, I want this war. I think this is a great idea. Some of them were shaking. He was humiliating them. And anyone who lives in Russia knows the system that Putin has built is built on nonstop humiliation. You're humiliated by your higher ups and it goes right to the top. It's a question where rights and dignity do not exist, where laws are passed which invalidate, which validates domestic violence against women. That's been one of the laws that Putin has passed recently. It is a system that says crushing rights, the rights of minorities, the rights of women, and the rights of smaller nations is something that is is a mark of, of, of its essence. 
And, and what does that mean? We know from psychology, I'm not a psychologist or a psychoanalyst, but I often speak to them, not as a patient, and maybe I should, but, but I, I find they can be very insightful about these things. When we have this culture which is built on humiliation, um, a culture built on sadomasochism in many ways, both on uh, um, oppressing and then looking for a leader that will then oppress you. It's a very strange political culture that always spills out into aggression. There's a psychological logic that always spills out into aggression and aggression in foreign policy. I would listen to how Putin speaks about women all the time. It's very, very careful. He speaks about Ukraine as the mother of all Russian cities, which is a trope in Russian culture, this deified thing. How dare it be torn away from me? How dare the mother have a life that the infant can't control? And then he talks about her as a prostitute who's left and sold out. I mean, a Kleinian psychoanalyst would have a field day with this bizarre, uh, uh, perverse psychology. And during a session with Emmanuel Macron, the French president, um, I hope it's okay that I'm using this language, Professor Ali, um, he described, he, he, he quoted a, a very lewd joke, um, a necrophiliac rape joke. It's a joke, you know, very bad taste joke, a misogynistic joke in Russian where, you know, the prince comes to, uh, Sleeping Beauty and he rapes her and says, you lie there, you lie there and you put up with it. And he said, Ukraine will lie there, lie there and put up with it. It is seething with misogyny and violence. Um, and let's, I'll say one last thing. Um, he talks a lot about spheres of influence. Russia deserves a sphere of influence. And the mistake is made that this is about security concerns, which can be balanced against each other in geopolitics. It has nothing to do with that. The Russian sphere of influence can wax and wane. It can stretch from the Pacific to the Atlantic, from India to um, the, the Bay of Biscay. It can just mean the Russia sphere. It's the sense that things belong to me, like an infant that hasn't understood its borders. This belongs to me. And I'll leave you with an insight by one of my favorite psychoanalysts, Henry Dix, who analyzed Nazi soldiers at the end of World War II. And he noticed that, that their idea of a Lebensraum really didn't have anything to do with specific ideas of geopolitics. It was a bizarre psychology which felt that it had the right to take away from others. I'm not making an equation between Nazism and Putin. Russia has its own totalitarian traditions. We don't, they, I, we, they, I'm a little bit Russian as well, um, uh, don't, don't need the Germans, but, but this underlying fascist psychology permeates the whole system and that can only expand into aggression. Thank you for that. Um, and I understand and I know that you have family in the Ukraine right now. And so thank you and please know that um, we're thinking about them. Um, I wanna ask um, General Gardner to follow up on his last point in question, at his last point with regards to bipartisan um, support and a bipartisan message that is a unifying message that the United States is sending globally, especially as you mentioned, that we're seeing a strategic partnership um, growing. Um, it exists and it's strengthening and it's becoming stronger um, by the minute between Russia and China. Um, and I, I'd love for you to, ex to expand a little bit on what you, what you think it's going to take um, in, in order for us to show uh, a bipartisan support around um, uh, foreign policy that will protect our democratic norms and interests. And if it, to, to expand on what um, Professor Pomerantz said was saying as well, um, and that's there are these fascist forces. Um, and I'd like to know, General Gardner, if you agree with that, if you do agree that what we're seeing is fascism. Um, and one more point on that, just to add to expand, so I don't have to ask, I don't have to interrupt, I won't interrupt you, um, but that's, over the past week, we've seen some pretty vocal voices with large platforms in the United States of existing and former politicians, US politicians showing support and sympathy and being sympathetic towards um, Vladimir Putin and Russia's invasion. Um, and so with that in mind, how are we going to, how does that fit into this equation of realizing bipartisan support? That's a tough, tough series of questions. I mean, it's a, you know, the, the world's complex and U.S. politics are equally complex. But I'm convinced, I mean, we're not in World War II, but if you go back to 1938, you know, the New Dealers and the non-New Dealers, the, the gap there was almost as great as it is now. But by early 1940, 
they still argued on things internally, but in terms of foreign policy, defense policy, people that had hated each other very quickly became partners. And uh, the result were, you know, it took us five or six years, we, we expanded capacity you know, through collaboration that, that, you know, brought people together that five years ago, previously would have thought never would happen. We're not at war two now, but I think the, the threats worldwide are almost as bad and not to be able to generate the same level of agreement in certain narrow areas, we won't agree. One agreement on immigration, guns, and other you know, domestic issues, but on basic uh, national security and international relations, we should be able to. And I think part of the challenge is that we, most people that are active in American politics, view things on the next election cycle. In, in us mm -hmm. winning the next election cycle, trumps anything at a broader scale. And I think certain times, and this is one, 1940 was another one where you need to break that cycle. And a handful of people need to stand up and say, we won't agree over here, but on these three or four issues, it's essential for us, our interest, the standard living of Americans and our allies to collaborate. And uh, somebody needs to pull that together. That, that's, a, that's a challenge that's really, really difficult. The Chinese-Russian partnership is concerning because that's, you know, we've kind of predicted that off and on since the, you know, the end of World War II and through the Cold War, but it never materialized, but it kind of has. I think the question is, well, how do we pressure China now to go back to them and say, how can you justify what Russia just did with Ukraine? You know, they've kind of been supportive of, of Russian security interests and critical NATO, but there's no way they can justify this. And we had to use that as leverage to get them to back off collaboration with Russia. But I think it's back to we need to think through uh, if Russia and China, in fact, are collaborating on a fairly significant scale in areas where they, where they can mass their effort. How do we logically think our way through what's our coherent approach to that? How do we bring in our allies? And in the 1949, or was we wrote NSC 68, it was, wasn't a particularly good paper, but it could outline U.S. foreign policy for the next 40 years. What's the current version of that that helps us deal with a world where Russia and China think the opposite of us and our allies? And, and how do you logically prepare for that? I think that's doable. Uh, Support in general for Putin, I'm not sure. I, I, I think a lot of that is just back to whoever's in the White House, whatever they do, you're going to oppose it. And uh, it's at times it's just difficult to comprehend in environments like this. I think the needs from both parties are reasonable people to stand up and say we need to put that aside, just like we did not before. This. And that I'm waiting for those people to kind of stand up. The fascism, I don't know. I'm not sure I understand Putin enough other than I, I I think he is living in another century. He's looking at a different world. He's trying to recreate something that, that kind of existed once that, uh, that I don't think he's going to get. But you know, in the process, how do we respond uh, in a logical way that, that mitigates his efforts and, and minimizes the violence and loss of life and the stability of the world economy? And uh, it's complex, but I think that's where we are. Well, the good thing is, uh, as powerful as he seems, they have huge internal problems. And the time is mm -hmm. on our side, and it's on the West side. Uh, same with China. China's got tremendous capability. The time is kind of on our side. And most people in the world uh, don't want that type of life. And so we need to leverage that long term. The question is, what are you near term? And back to what I suggested, what we need to do with uh, our immediate response to Russia. Uh, hopefully that's yeah. kind of rambled, but that's some thoughts. No, you don't at all actually i wanted to ask you do you think they're saying the same thing about us oh yeah i mean i i think maybe part of the reason putin did this now we looked in in most of our you know european allies we looked internally we're in disarray we disagree on everything you know no matter what one one side says the other is opposed to it uh they probably think that and i knew a lot of chinese students in boston a couple of years ago who think you know us you're in decline uh you know we're kind of ascendant as china I think that's how they see it. But we kind of saw that we thought this in the 1980s. We thought Japanese with their economy were growing. We were in the farm. I think uh, there's something compelling about open societies that have strong economies that can deal with challenges and can collaborate. And uh, you have ups and downs like a sine wave, but I think we can survive this. It's back to we have huge advantages that neither China nor Russia has, but we continue to shoot ourselves in both feet. And when you leverage those and you work with our traditional allies that have common values, uh, that capacity outweighs anything Russia or China can do, but you have to be able to work collaboratively. We've kind of lost that.
So I hear you saying common values, key phrase. Yeah, I mean, um, we all have interests, we all have common values. Right. But there are certain countries in the world where sometimes our interests don't overlap, but our common values always do. And, and you know, how do you how do you reinforce that? I think this is a time where we need to reinforce that with the Europeans and, and Japan and Australia. I think this is a wake up call with others we need to do. Thank you. And building on that, Professor Wiselow, I want to ask you, because you mentioned this in your remarks as well, what do you think this crisis tells us from your perspective about the United States today and the degree of its responsibility for what many call a new renewal of the Cold War? And how does this worldview um, of us this century, um, how does that factor in after 20 years of the war on terror? Uh, th those, that's also a, um, a, a huge set of questions, and I'll, I'll take a, a shot. They're interesting. I don't know if my colleagues would be interested in, jo in joining in. That, I mean, two, two moments really stand out for me. One is, again, a historical example that, that the, the so-called liberal international order that was created in the aftermath of the Second World War in 1945 was the creation of a generation of American statesmen for Russianists, the most famous of them is George, George Cannon, but there are a whole series um, of, of them as well, who essentially um, looked at the 20th century, which was a century of mayhem and disintegration, and, and many would argue a long war of 1914, 1945, and, and, and looked at it as the product of the rule of men, um, rather than the rule of law and establish an, inter an international right. order of the rule of law. And right. that plainly is being questioned. Um, mm -hmm. That yes. uh, withdrawal from NATO uh, as a boy in the Midwest, US out of UN was a cranky thing on an old battered billboard on the side of the interstate. But now in some fringes of American national politics, it's actually a policy position. Um, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so you find yourself wondering um, when 53% of the American population, the last poll I saw actually thinks that the United States shouldn't be involved um, in Ukraine at all. Um, uh, you find yourself wondering about who we, we are, not our politicians, but who we are as a people. Um, and whether we as a people actually, in fact, believe in this international order. Uh, mm. A new Cold War, what's interesting about the Cold War, and I'll be very brief here, what's interesting about the Cold War, in my mind, has always been as a, as a person who, you know, whose professional life is a product, really, uh, of the Cold War, um, that, the, that the, the Cold War and, it, and its consequences were first most evident in Russia, which after all lost the Cold War. Um, so that the disintegration of the 90s, the weakening of the Russian state, the disintegration of the Russian economy from the point of view of a Putin, the disintegration of empire are all a product of defeat in the Cold War. And you can even hear this in Putin's thinking um, today. In many ways, the United States has never really confronted the end of the Cold War. Since as the victor, we became the hegemon. Um, mm -hmm. And as the hegemon, the world was really ours and ours to such a, a degree that, in fact, you could think about making Iraq in Afghanistan safe for democracy. Um, mm -hmm. 20 years later, of course, um, that's that's not the case. And so you find yourself wondering about the post Cold War crisis in both of the two former competing superpowers, um, a new chapter, certainly in the Russian case is now um, in evidence um, on, on, on the agenda, how the United States actually is able to react to that. I, I would also love to see Republican and Democratic senators standing in front of the White House um, with the president saying, you know, on this, we are united in on this foreign policy, domestic politics actually stops um, at the nation's shoreline. But there's also a part of me that finds that scenario difficult to imagine at, at the moment. And the United States in that sense is going to find itself also wrestling with um, the, the consequences of 
ultimately maintaining a liberal order. Is it ours or, 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 or not? So those are two jumbled um, commentaries, but I think, you know, both of them have to do with American politics and the way that the United States will be impacted by this crisis um, in Eastern Europe. Yes, and giving us a lot to think about. And before we turn to Q&A with our audience members, I wanna ask um, one last question um, that's for both you, Professor David and Palmer and Seth, because you both um, mentioned this and that's the, that role of propaganda um, and tropes and the, and, and, and the dangerousness of that. And, and I'd love to hear your comments and thoughts on how we counter that effectively. Professor David, we can start with you. Sorry, I'm just... Oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think one of the things that I thought was really interesting coming out of this is that one of the big opposition figures um, in Russia, uh, Alexei Navalny, who's currently in prison, his response to everything happening with Ukraine is, if you turn on the Russian tel, if you turn on Russian television, you don't ever see anything about Russia. You just see stuff that's going on in Ukraine and you see stuff that's going on in the West because there's it's much easier to paint this image of, of an outside world that is, you know, um, everybody is, is gathering together for Russia's decline, Ukraine is overrun by Nazis, as opposed to actually showing on television what's happening in Russia, uh, where, you know, people are trying to confront daily life there, everyday issues, this pandemic, all of those things. And, and I think that um, on Russian news, you know, the portrayal that you see of Ukraine is just so divorced from, from reality. Um, I mean, Professor Weissel mentioned that uh, the Ukrainian president Zelensky, he gave this speech in Russian and it's not gonna be played on Russian TV, but it's all over the internet. Uh, Russians can go and, and listen to this speech they can see uh, things happening in Ukraine. They can talk to their relatives there. But, and, and I think Peter and, and his work probably would know this better than I do. I mean, it's, it's a matter of which version of reality are they going to accept? Are they going to accept the version of Ukraine that appears on Russian news, which is this hostile, uh, again, this country overrun, overrun by, by Nazis and, and all these other kind of made up issues? Mm -hmm. Or are they going to actually listen to, you know, what Ukrainians themselves are saying, many of whom are their own friends and, and relatives. And I think it shows sort of the power of the media to really kind of paint the situation. I'm, I'm not sure what the solution is, but, but I think this focus by, by uh, Russian TV on Ukraine over the past uh, few months, especially, is just really, really dangerous. Professor Pomerantsev. So the question was about which bit, inside Russia or just generally in the world? Both. So um, I thought that was, that, that was, Catherine put it so well. I wanna actually take a little other side of this, which is um, back in the Cold War, which, which uh, Frank mentioned. Um, one thing we were slightly better at was talking directly to the Russian people. Uh, something called public diplomacy. And there was even these events when, towards the end of the Cold War, of course, when Reagan went on Russian television, Soviet television, talked directly to the Soviet people. Um, back then it was very hard. Things were jammed. It was very hard to sort of like get through on the radio, let alone get on Soviet TV. That was a very special event. These days it would be very easy to reach out to the Russian people. Um, you can do it on social media and, and any type of, any, 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 all sorts of tools. And you've got to understand, Putin is in a very complicated position. On the one hand, he uses conspiracy theories to create this veil and this paranoia that the whole world is against Russia. And we could dig into those conspiracy theories and why they're effective. But at the same time, he knows that everybody in Russia aspires to a Western lifestyle, watches Western TV. Um, their favorite show is Dr. House. We can think about why that is, but I think it, there's a good reason for it. Uh, they love Western music. They deeply, they would listen to American military, by the way, if they talked to them. They would listen to Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's a politician and a hero there, if they talked to them. There are so many ways for us to reach out. There are so many topics that we could engage the Russian people over. In education, science and tech, health. These are all things that they would listen to. We would get trolled, but they would listen. They would engage. 
And what the conversation we need to open up is what is the role of Russia in the world, which isn't aggressive, which isn't based on the cycle of humiliation and aggression, which starts to come to terms with its past, which is not something that Russia has ever done, um, and which starts to imagine a role for Russia, which is in harmony with its neighbors. There is an alternative universe where Russia is a successful, reforming, maybe not a perfect democracy, country that Ukraine wants to be near to because it's successful and near and there's language ties. Russia could have done that. Russia could have been the great success story of Eurasia. They have all the talent and all the resources. They couldn't deal with something deeply locked into, into their past, I think. Um, and Ukraine is running away because Ukraine wants to live. They understand that Russia is becoming self-destructive. Um, so we have, but there are many people in Russia who are not like Putin, who don't want to live in a political system of humiliation and aggression where the normal thing is to humiliate people. They want to have, and this word is very important in Russia, Narmalny, a normal world. They keep on talking about this. The word normal is very, very important in, in, in Russian discourse and, and is also always predicated on a lack, something we don't have. Um, we need to start that conversation until Russians start being able to articulate this role for themselves in the world, it'll never happen. You can't cede the intellectual space in Russia to Vladimir Putin and his bizarre historical fantasies and aggressions. Most Russians, I think, if you were to poll them, want a normal relationship with their neighbors. And, and we can start doing that. We can start reaching out, we can start having those conversations. It also means funding universities is a very good a proposal by Alexander, Alexander Etkind, a very famous and amazing Russian historian and sort of historian of trauma um, to create a European university in Riga that would bring Russian students, students from Ukraine and the Balts together, start having this conversation. This is long-term. Yeah, today we need sanctions and I hope we'll be able to impose some costs on Russia. But in the long-term, because Putin is in it for the long-term, we need to reopen this public diplomacy and this sort of creating the space of, education, imagination, so a different Russia can come into being. Thank you for that. Um, we will turn to our audience now for questions. The first question is several people have asked questions relating to the similarities to how current events may resemble the start of World War II. So number one, do you see some similarity with the beginning of World War II and Hitler invading Austria, Poland, and the rest of the world doing nothing? And how close do you think we are to World War III? This is an open question for whoever wants to take it. I, my, my guess is I, you know, I don't think, I think there are some similarities, but I think the world, the world is, is dramatically different. I think Europe is stronger now than it was uh, in 1938, 39. I think the United States in some ways is wider than it was in 1938, 39. And I think, uh, Russia doesn't have the capacity that Nazi Germany did, which may be the saving grace of this. They have they have near term capacity, uh, but I don't. I think the parallel kind of ends there. The, the challenge is anytime you have a, a conflict that involves a nation that's got a large nuclear force, you know, the, it's it's there are serious questions about the scope of the conflict. Uh, but beyond that, I think uh, I don't think we're headed for World War Three. I think we're headed for a fair amount of instability in Europe and how we deter the Russians from doing anything further, force them out of the Ukraine, out of Ukraine, and, uh, and restore stability is a big question. And I think we have the capacity to do that, but again, it gets back to, you have to collaborate to do that. And I think right now we're, we're doing that with our allies. I, I can I just jump in quickly to, Absolutely. I just, I think another another difference that I think is really important, and, and I think this has been discussed by our panelists, is that, you know, Russia is, is not Nazi Germany in the sense of this sort of entirely uh, mo society mobilized towards wanting war or mobilized towards hatred. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Russians do not hate uh, the Ukrainian people in the way that that Nazi Germany taught its people to hate Slavs and Jews and, and others. Um, and there is not this mass desire in Russia for a war to restore an empire like there was in, in Nazi Germany. Um, and I think that's really, really important. I think that a lot of 
just I was reading the sociological data, a lot of Russians who kind of when you ask them their views on, on Ukrainians, they think, oh, they've sort of been duped into this Ukrainian nationalism. They kind of have a bad government um, and probably things would be better for them if, if they recognize just how great Russia is. But they don't have these there, there's not this kind of ethnic hatred or, again, I think this desire of, of kind of mass mobilization towards war that we've seen in, in other countries. Um, and I think that's an important thing to note when we are trying to find historical comparisons. This next question is for you, Peter, and it is, can you clarify what type of online activities you advocate to help the people of Ukraine? Well, look, it's not the online activities is not is not the be all and end on the, the online activities are one way to ensure pressure um, around a coordinated and tough response, first of all, on sanctions. Um, so, I mean, it's just the thing that all of you can do. I mean, obviously, there's there's a lot of other ways to, to influence that. But I'm just saying there's something that you uh, students at this glorious university um, can do right now. Um, so I think your generation is much better at doing hashtags and Twitter things. And, you know, you know, this is the generation that did Black Lives Matter and Me Too, you know, far more than I do. I'm just saying this is what we need to do. It's a very specific aim. It's not a like, oh, save Ukraine. It's a like, very specific. We need to persuade the G7 to enforce a ban on, on SWIFT vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. You can look up what SWIFT is. It's a financial mechanism. It's a really big hit but there are some countries dragging their feet um that's just a very specific thing i i would say whenever you're doing a campaign probably be specific you know you've got to sort of like you know find a, a specific aim and, and go for that though professor ali will know much more than i do about online campaigns thank you for that um so in this next question is directly for you um general and it is what are the implications of u.s nato's response in ukraine for China's pressure on Taiwan? Yeah, that's a great question. I, mean, I think it's back to, you know, how, how do we and our allies establish what, what is acceptable behavior? And clearly what Russia has done is not, and I think it, it's, it's similar for Taiwan. I mean, Taiwan ability to maintain its own sovereignty though it's technically part of China. But uh, I think part of our effort needs to be, you know, as we address the you know, Russia-Chinese partnership, uh, is to get Russia, get China to back off their support of what Russia's done, and also indicate that you know, we we and our allies won't accept anything similar in Taiwan. And one one is an example of what could happen. In other. I think our, our necessity of being clear and establishing the mechanisms uh, that bring together multilateral organizations, you know, our allies in the Pacific and in Europe, are essential to doing. It. I think we've been unclear. I think this is another wake up call that we need to reinforce the John. And this is a question for all of you. Um, uh, how have your projections of how this conflict will play out changed over the past few weeks? And what do you think is the most likely reaction by the West and allies in eventual outcomes of the conflict? Well, I mean, I'll try. The, the way mine have played out over the last several weeks has been that um, this is a mobilization of much Russian military resources to threaten Ukraine, to this is um, a, 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 an attempt to support the breakaway statelets in the east and, and expand them to the full territorial borders of the two regions or oblasts um, that uh, you are constantly hearing about to, as I said at the outset of my remarks, astonishment at a full-scale military invasion. But I also think that's how quickly um, events have been uh, have been moving. And as is usually the case with um, ex post facto viewpoints, um, you in fact see the plan that was in place um, over time much more clearly now at, their con at the conclusion of these events than, you, than I did certainly um, uh, leading up to them. And the next question is, what does the US gain from NATO expansion? Is it worth provoking conflict with a nuclear power? That's another tough one. I think, I think you can argue that we, we expanded too quickly and that helped reinforce you know, autocratic forces inside Russia 
when we started expanding, you know, the first four or five years, went from 12 to 20 or what it was. Uh, but it's a hard issue. You know, I, we probably weren't going to have or allow Ukraine in for a while anyway. Same with Georgia. There's some milestones they have to meet. And so it probably was a non-issue, except to Putin, it clearly was. But uh, I think we need to look at now, you know, Sweden and Finland have never been, they never wanted to be, but recently they've kind of indicated desire because they're concerned with Russia. I mean, the concerns are probably pretty valid. Do we allow them in or does that become you know, more, uh, more fuel on the fire? I'm not sure. You know, I think we'll probably just have a pause for a while until events in Ukraine play out and then reassess you know, what's you know, the way ahead in terms of expansion. Uh, the second half of that, though, is I think, back to the previous question, I think that uh, we'll see you know, for the first time, probably since World War II, uh, maybe 9-11, uh, Europe and NATO and the U.S. unified in one course of action. And, and kind of Putin's kind of brought that along. We couldn't do it, so he's kind of forced it. I think you'll see a more solidified NATO, uh, both in its response to their invasion of Ukraine and its support of the Baltics and countries that feel pressured and uh, and I think that'll play out over the next couple of weeks. But expansion, I think, will probably be on hold until we sort out what's going on with you know, this particular incident. And, uh, and the next issue would be, do we allow Finland and Sweden in if they want to, you know, as a response to the Russian invasion? Could I just add, I think it's important not to, um, not to see what's going on in Ukraine and the, um, the uh, NATO and American response to these events as um, as a um, as a reaction to an attempt to expand NATO, this is after all is the the Putin argument of what's going on in 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 um, in, in Ukraine, and so that you know, that while there's a history there as as well, and one that has come under question, and most recently by Thomas Friedman in this nor week's New York Times. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, nevertheless, the, the questioner has to keep in mind that really this isn't a war about NATO. It is a it is mm -hmm. a, a it is a response that's that's structured on the United Nations Charter. Peter mentioned very early on the remarks of the ambassador from Kenya um, in the UN Security Council mm -hmm. this week, um, who basically framed this as this is very old style, old fashioned imperialism. And we in Africa who have brothers and communities and families on either sides of borders that were drawn by statesmen in London and in Paris and in, and in Lisbon, right. um, know full well what this action is. And so it's an attempt to suppress sovereignty. And, and I think that actually is the key issue that we're confronting here and being asked about the degree to which um, both politically and ultimately militarily, we want to um, act on that challenge to um, a, a nation's sovereignty. Yeah, Professor David mentioned that too. You mentioned the Security Council has come up several times and Russia currently holds the presidency of the Security Council. We've talked a lot about sanctions. Um, what is your point of view on whether or not, is this is in discussion right now too globally, um, what that means for the United Nations, what that means for credibility and the trust of the Security Council, given that Russia is the president of the UN, the UN Security Council at this moment. It happens Russia to holds be an the irony. It's an irony of history. Uh, it, it just it happens that the chairman chairmanship uh, of the the chair of the Security Council rotates among the, uh, right. the members of the Security Council, and it happens to be Russia at the moment. You, you'd have to watching the uh, and watching the, those um, uh, speeches play over the last forty eight hours. Right, um, actually, is a moment of for the United Nations actually not of of weakness. But it seems to me of strength, um, given given the very direct challenge to the UN Charter that's um, that's afoot here. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. Thank you for that. Because a lot of people are wondering, um, and we have a question here. We can touch on it a little bit, but there's a very specific question, and that is, what can we say about Putin's current mental state? What do we know? Do we know? I uh, well, I don't. I don't feel as if I can comment on anyone's uh, mental state. Sometimes not even my own. Uh, but I think that um, 
what I think people have observed, at least in the speech that he gave on, on Monday. And I, I keep coming back to it, but I think it was a really key moment that really set the tone for the next few days. Is that, you know, in, in that speech, he did seem to be at least performing a lot of anger and performing a lot of resentment in, in that speech. And, and I think that how he's portrayed himself to the world in, in, uh, in that speech, in the meeting he had with his security council, which was televised, a thing that's not, not normally televised, and in mm -hmm. press conferences after, he's trying to perform that he's sort of very aggrieved and that he is very sort of emotionally, and we don't always use that word when we talk about male politicians, but I think it, it is a real kind of display of, of emotion here. And I think that that is, you know, maybe that is leading some people to comment on his mental state, but I, I do think that it's deliberate. Um, and I think mm -hmm. he wants to sort of show that to the world, this narrative of, um, well, I don't really want to be involved in this war, but I just can't help myself when I see what's happening in Ukraine. Um, and I think he's playing that pretty effectively. Mm -hmm. This next question is directly for you, Peter, and that is, can you discuss the implications of removing Russia from SWIFT and whether or not you think this can happen soon? So, I, I mean, there might be actually others who are better than me, than me but it would, it would be, um, I better Google it quickly. Um, so I'm not a finance guy, but it would be a very, very, make much harder for Russian businesses to make any kind of transactions internationally, basically. Swift is like, on your card, you know, on your, oh, I've got one of these ridiculous cards through the post just now, like, you are already pre-signed. I mean, there's a little sort of visa thing. So cut Russia out of visa transactions and stuff like that. If there's better finance people, you can give more depth to that. Um, the, the difficulty is it would then, um, you know, mean some sort of economic hit to Europe as well, because they do a lot of business with Russian companies. But, you know, this is really the essence of this argument. Firstly, it's, firstly, it's a big sanction that has been talked about for seven years. It's not a new thing. This is something that was talked about and talked about and talked about as the big weapon that would really hit Russia economically. And frankly, it's very shocking that, that now this is happening, there are still countries dragging their feet. But it's more than that, it's deeper than that. I mean, the countries dragging their feet are countries from the European core. Um, I'm very much a product of Europe. Um, I've written many essays about it. I, I went, even went to a, a special school designed by the founders of the EU to create the ideal European citizen. I mean, I'm, I'm very much a part of that tradition. Um, and it's a tradition that, that, that is based on overcoming um, the horrors of the 20th century. That's what it's mm. about. And it's about using economics and trade as a way to overcome historical mm. monstrosity. Second World War, the Cold War, the despotism in the Iberian Peninsula. That's the, that's the European project. And it's almost as if the European project has forgotten its roots. What is happening now is exactly what Europe is meant to stand against. It's meant to be the story of, of, of the European project. And the fact that as a, as a set of institutions and as a culture, it can't remember why it exists is an appalling moment. And that's actually one of Putin's great arguments that all that stuff about human rights and rights generally, well, that's nonsense, just PR. Deep down, you're just greedy, weak, and I will buy you and break you. Mm. That's why it's so important. Last question, and this is for you, Katie. Does religion play any role in this conflict? Is Putin using religion to press um, his progressive aims, his aggressive aims, not progressive, aggressive aims. <laughs> he would call, he would call them progressive. I, I know, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this is my area of interest. So right. of course I'm gonna say that it's relevant, but I think it is actually, it's, it's very relevant because of one of the things that sort of Putin and, and other, uh, you know, uh, Frank mentioned, uh, you know, Putin drawing a lot on imperial thinkers. And, and the reason this is important is because one of the things that does connect Russia and Ukraine is a common orthodox religious tradition. Mm -hmm. And I think that as much as we can think of the world in national terms, I think Putin has also a vision of, of the world in these religious terms and has a mm -hmm. conception of this Russian world Based on based on orthodoxy, um, and that this is sort of a justification for why Ukraine should be in Russia's sphere of influence is that they can both trace their religious tradition back to to Kiev, and I think what's interesting is that um, two 
two years ago, I guess at, at this point, Ukraine actually declared its Orthodox Church to be independent of, of Russia. And this was a claim that was actually recognized by um, the, the patriarch in Constantinople. And this was a moment that actually Putin mentioned in his speech on Monday as sort of mm -hmm. evidence that the whole world was against them. That, wow, even our church doesn't, doesn't recognize that we have this uh, tie, tie to Ukraine. And, you know, I think there's a lot of arguments about sort of the constructed nature of nations that are at play here. But I think what people can look back historically is that these religious ties have always sort of been, been used in this way, but they've, they've also always been used by Ukrainians to contest their relationship to Russia. So I think religion has always played a role in, in this conflict. And it's interesting to see how it's now being mapped on to kind of more modern ideas of, of, of spheres of, of influence, uh, which would not have been sort of the, the way that you would have seen a religious jurisdiction a few hundred years ago. And with that, um, we will end this discussion, but to be continued, um, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you audience for your questions and for staying with us um, for the past 60 minutes. Please do stay in touch. We will have a recording. We will be following up with you um, over email. If you have any further questions, um, please do email us and we will try to get those. We'll try to get answers to you. Thank you again. And um, um, again, I just want to say to you again, Peter, we're thinking of you and your family um, in the Ukraine um, net for now and, and for um, days and weeks to come. Thank Look, you. I'm in Chevy Chase. I'm fine. My family are in, in a place in Ukraine. They'll be fine. But thank you. There are millions, there are 40 million Ukrainians who are, um, who, who deserve our, the most that we can do for them. We'll do our best. Thank you.